usually announces the, the invitation song number again once he has the mic on because we're afraid somebody might not hear. I'm not worried about that. That got done. <laughs> that was impressive. <clears throat> you know, uh, as you're turning to, to your song, and I want you to think about how connected we are in today's society and how we are able to communicate with people from very far away uh, in a very short notice that might not have happened so frequently in the past. I mean, I remember back when I was uh, in high school and in love with a girl, or so I thought maybe, uh, we used to send letters to one another because it was just too expensive to talk to one another on the phone. You had to call long distance, and that was quite costly, and I didn't have a job at the time, and you know... Uh, my parents weren't going to pay for me to talk, but I could afford like a 26-cent stamp. I guess that's how long ago it was, uh, that we could afford that. And now we pay for cell phones that we can call anytime. We can call wherever we want, and it all costs the same anyway. It's unlimited uh, in what we could do. And sometimes we're so connected with people from far away that sometimes we're not connected with the people that are close. Sometimes we miss those connections because we're too focused on worrying about what's going on on social media, worrying about what's going on on the news or, or whatever, maybe texting somebody that's far away while we're sitting at the dinner table with our family, and therefore we're missing those moments of connection. And I hope to help us to get back on track uh, if, that, if that is the case for you this evening. I want to look at the idea of the mission of the church this evening. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus says that he has been given all authority and that he is telling the disciples there, the apostles, to go into all the world. And there they are to make disciples. They are to make disciples and they're to baptize them once they are made disciples. And then they're to teach them to observe all things that God has commanded them. And so there's a process that Jesus wants them to go through in order to bring someone to Christ so that they might become disciples of his. And I want to look at that concept this evening and how he intends for us to do that. I want to talk about what's the heart of the mission. Not just the mission itself, but what is at the heart of the mission. And I think Jesus illustrates it for us in the way that he did something just as he was nearing the end of his life. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 17... They were in Jericho, and it says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them. So he's about to tell them some things as they're going from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now that journey from Jericho to Jerusalem, Jesus knew, would be his last journey into Jerusalem. It was then that he was taken captive. It was then that he was led away to the cross. And so he's going to tell them some things that are very very important. Now he tells us tells those things, and these are recorded in, in Matthew 20, 17 through 19, Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34, and Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. And here's what he tells them. He says, I'm going to be betrayed by one of you. So he lets them know. Now I didn't say who exactly here just yet. That's not known. They wondered who it was, but he says, I'm going to be betrayed. He goes on and he tells them he, he's going to be condemned. Not only is he going to be condemned, but he's going to be delivered to the Gentiles, that being the Romans of the day, since they were the ones in charge, that he would be delivered to the Gentiles, that he would be mocked, he would be spit upon, he would be scourged, he would be killed by crucifixion, and then he would be resurrected on the third day. Now this is all that he has told them is going to happen. So he's heading to, from Jericho to Jerusalem, tells them exactly what's going to happen. Now, obviously, they have a hard time believing this. And Luke's account says they don't understand what's going on. He says, but they understood none of those things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Now, to us looking back, it's very easy to see exactly what happened. <laughs> We're able to see the, what happened at the end, and so it's hard for us to wrap our minds. He just told him what was going to happen. Not only that, he repeats it. He doesn't say it just once. 
So he's, he's telling them this. He tells them at least three times exactly what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And they still don't get it. And so he gives them a parable in Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. says, and now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem because they thought the kingdom of God would immediately appear. Or appear immediately. I think I went King James there. Sorry. The idea, the concept here is that they didn't get it, so he begins to tell them a parable. And the parable is uh, about the pounds, the parable of the pounds. And he's letting them know what's going to happen, and he's talking to them about the servants who would be faithful, the servants who would reject him, and the servant who was lazy and didn't do anything. But he, he preached it to them because he was nearing Jerusalem, and they didn't understand. Now think about the climate of the day. This is why they didn't get it. So I, I want to be a little bit fair to them why they didn't get it. They thought that a figure was going to come along, a political figure who would come along and lead Israel back to prominence. That he would become the king like the king of David of old. And that's who the Messiah was supposed to be. And so for him to say, I'm going to go and I'm going to be crucified by the Romans, that was foreign to them. Because the kingdom of God had not yet been established when the kingdom of God, the Israel, would be restored when Jesus sat on the throne. So they didn't get it, that's why. And I, I want to give him a little leeway here as to why, even though he told them over and over and over. But he, pre, he said this parable, but you know what he was going to do? John 19, verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he says, it is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Jesus knew what he was going to do. Jesus knew what his purpose was. He knew what his mission was. His mission was to go to the cross. And when he went to the cross, he says, it's finished. I've done what I came to do. So I want to look at some things that happened on the road. We have him foretelling his death, and then him going into Jerusalem. We have the parable of the kingdom right before he went in. And, and, and Luke's account is the only one that has the parable, because Luke's account is the only one that says they didn't get it. So that's why he's explaining it there. But I want to focus on three events that happen in the middle. Because it's these three events that help us to understand the mission that Jesus understood. And that Jesus wants us to understand about the mission. To understand the heart of that mission. Now this, these stories I'm going to go backwards a little bit. Only because I'm trying to fit them in the order of the Great Commission. But I think all three of them will, will be seen. So first one we're going to talk about the idea of making disciples. And we see that in account in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Here's a guy that I identify really well with. It's Zacchaeus. I'm a short guy. I get this. I go to the grocery store, and sometimes I have to ask the tall guy to get the stuff on the shelf. And this guy, there was a parade that was going on. And it was Jesus. He was the, he was the only one in the parade. But people were lined in the streets to see Jesus, and it was crowded. And he couldn't see over people. I imagine he probably started jumping, trying to see. I don't know if he did that or not. The Scripture doesn't tell us. But it reminds me of the days that I would go to the uh, homecoming parade of, of my high school. And I couldn't see because I was even shorter because I was a kid, and Dad would hoist me up. My dad's 6'2", so I don't know what happened to me, but... He hoists me on his shoulders so I could see the floats that are going by. Zacchaeus did something similar. Now, Dad's not a big tree, but that's what Zacchaeus does. He finds a tree, he climbs up that tree so that he can see Jesus. That's all he's trying to do is see Jesus. But Jesus took an opportunity here. He saw Zacchaeus up in the tree. Verse 5 says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. And said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Now Jesus is going from Jericho to Jerusalem. He needs to go to Jerusalem so that he can complete his mission. But he says, I need to stay at your house. I need to spend some time with you. And we see him here making a disciple. What is a disciple? 
Well, a disciple is a student, but it's much more than just being a student. We use that term sometimes, and that's we say that, but there was a rabbi and there was a student. The student followed the rabbi wherever the rabbi went. They, they would give up their former life. They would give up other things that they were doing. Remember, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they left their nets so that they could follow the teacher, the rabbi. They then became disciples, students. They were apprentices, if you will. And so that's what he has called for us to ask of other people, to talk to them about being disciples. And to do that, it takes time. He says, let me come stay at your house. And they actually have a conversation while they're there. And Zacchaeus opens up to Jesus. And he says, if I've taken anything from any man, because he was a tax collector, see. If I've taken anything from any other person, I'll restore it fourfold. And Jesus says, you're healed, you're forgiven, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we, from that, we get the mission and the heart of it. It's about investing in people to make them disciples. We have to spend time talking to them about Jesus and about what Jesus has to offer. And if we don't invest that time in them, then they won't invest that time in Jesus. So we've got to do that. We've, that's the heart of the mission. So we see that in that, this story. But notice the second thing that happens. He talks about go, go make disciples of them and baptize them. And we read about a blind man or two blind men. And there's not a discrepancy that one uh, call, says one blind man because... There were usually uh, a, a dominant personality, and so they would wrap that whole story up in the one person uh, rather than with two. That's a way of writing in the Middle East uh, that was normal to do. But here we have some men as Jesus was, again, as he was, as he was walking by, he's being thronged by people, and there are these guys out there that are saying, Help me, son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples like, shh, shh, don't, don't bother Jesus. He's on a mission. Don't, don't we do that sometimes? Don't bother Jesus. He's on a mission. <laughs> We've got things to do. We've got church to do. We, got, we have a fellowship opportunity. <coughs> Excuse me. And all those things. There's things we have to do for the church. We don't have time to stop and deal with this person. Jesus says, no, 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 bring them to me. And he, what does he do with them? So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. He healed them. What is baptism if not a healing? We are broken when we come to Jesus and he mends us. He heals us. Just like he did those blind men. He tells them that they, they, they can receive their sight and he fixed them. That's what baptism does through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It fixes us. So that we walk in newness of life. We go from blindness to being able to see. That's exactly what happened to these men. But Jesus had to stop his mission. He interrupted the mission that he was going to do which was to die on the cross. Why? Because their healing was the mission. That's the heart of the mission. And he had to stop, and he had to spend some time, and he had to talk to them, and he had to invest in them in order to do that. And so we're going to have to do the same if we're going to baptize people. It's, it's going to be much more than just telling them you've got to be baptized. Why? Why do, they, why do they need that? So you help them and you invest some time in them and say, hey, I, I need to come stay at your house. Let's talk about Jesus and the salvation that he brings. And then you fix them. You heal them and you show the power that Jesus has. But you don't leave them alone. He says, teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So it goes beyond even just baptizing them. 
in Matthew 20 and Mark chapter 10, we read of another story that Jesus interrupts his mission, and he stops for just a moment. Are you offering that to me? Because if you are, I, yes. <clears throat> I really thought on the way here that the Dust Bowl had returned. There were sp some spots that were pretty dusty, and so... Thank you. <clears throat> we have a story here. One story says that it was the mother of James and John. The other one says it was James and John that approached Jesus. But both of them, the intent was, when you set up your kingdom, again, you got to put yourself in their mindset. They were thinking Jesus was going to sit on a literal throne in Israel he was going to restore the kingdom, and so what she asks, can James sit on one side and John sit on the other when you are in your kingdom? Well, you can imagine then what the others thought. Oh, really? <laughs> you want this place. You want this place of honor. What about me? Why shouldn't I get that spot? I've been just as close as, as you have. I've been walking around with him just as long as you have. I left my net too. This is my spot. You, why would you get it over any of us? And so they were angry about that. But Jesus says, look, it's not mine to give. I, whether who, who sits on what side of me, that's, that's, the Father will, will give that. But he also says, you need to learn service. The Gentiles, they lord authority over other people. He says, but even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, once we're baptized, it's not about being put, put in a place of honor. Now, we are. We are placed in the kingdom. We are translated out of the power of darkness and we are translated into the kingdom of his dear son so we are given in that sense a place of honor the parable that he talks about the great feast we are given a place at the table so yes in that sense it is a place of honor but it's not a place of honor you deserve and you don't deserve it any more than any other person if we got what we deserved we'd all get hell We'd all get death. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God, though, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this position of honor is not an idea or a concept that look at what I've done. Look at the work that I did because I was baptized. We can't go around talking like that. Can't even be thinking that way. It's the mercy that God grants. It's the work that Jesus did on the cross that allows us that position and now we need to realize that to teach people to help people to understand what their goal is what the mission is you've got to spend some time working with them in service to them so that they can learn how to serve too that's the heart of the mission see jesus foretold of his death we have one person who requested honor once he stopped to heal the blind, you have the publican or the tax collector's salvation. You have the parable of the kingdom and Jerusalem. So it's right here that we learn the heart of the mission. It's right there in front of us. <clears throat> the fact that Jesus took the time to do what he did is not insignificant. It's actually profound. Because he was going to die and if you look at that idea and that concept he knew from the beginning that that's what he was going to do and yet he stopped three times to teach and to heal and to make followers for him because the mission is always about the people the mission is important to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that mission is very important. That mission is vital. We have to do it. That mission is essential. Without us doing it, people can't be saved. But people are the mission. The heart 
the idea, the very heart of the mission, go into all the world to do what? To preach to those that are lost. To preach to those that don't have Jesus. It's not just about going through the list and checking off the box and making sure that I taught this and I taught that and I taught that. If they don't want it, well, they just don't want it. I'll shake the dust off my feet and I'll move on. That's not what Jesus meant. He wants us to invest in people because people are the mission. The whole idea, the whole concept. <clears throat> I struggle with this at times. I was having a conversation with someone and they were talking about how sometimes we think of evangelism and, and specifically being an evangelist. Sometimes I look at it as my job and you go, well, yeah, you should. No, I shouldn't. It's an extent, it should be just an extension of what I do and who I am. It's not my job. Everything I do shouldn't be job-oriented. Well, I'm doing this because, but sometimes I can't help it because it's what I do. That's the way I think. And I start looking at things like, how many people were at church? Am I doing my job if enough, if not everybody was there? If so-and-so missed, what, what do I need to do? <coughs> And I start worrying about who's there and who's listening and who's paying attention or all those things. And I start worrying about, well, did I meet my quota of people I need to go visit this week? Did I, did I meet my quota of the different Bible studies that I was supposed to do? And I forget sometimes. It's not about a quota. It's about souls. And we need to focus on those souls and what we can do to invest in them not so I can notch something in my Bible that says this person was baptized and I can move on, but because that person needs Jesus. And so I've got to invest in them. Spend some time with them. And you do too. It's not about how many people are in the seats. It's not about how much money is given on the, in the collection. Those are petty things. Those aren't important. Now, people being there is important because they need a closer relationship with Jesus. Not because we need some arbitrary quota. We hope for money in the collection, not because we want somebody to make sure that they're giving, but, but because we need that money to go out and preach the gospel to pre people who are dying and going to hell. I hope that I'm, I'm making sense. I'm conveying what, I'm, what it is that I'm trying to say in all this. The church is more than a building. Matter of fact, the church is not the building. It's not at all. We don't go to church. That's not what we do. Jesus said it this way <clears throat> in Luke 17 and verse 20. He says, but when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. You are the church. You are the kingdom. We get wrapped up sometimes in the building and all the things that go on with that, and it's easy to do. And we even get wrapped up in some of the programs that we're trying to do. And so, I hope you know what I mean by that. But how many fellowships do we have? Well, that's not even the use of the word fellowship in Scripture. Fellowship means brotherhood or communion, common union, a togetherness, a, a group of people, the church. <laughs> it's about us really developing relationships because the church is you. And it will not happen. We will lose people if we don't invest in people. So we've got to spend time with one another. We've got to spend time investing in the word of God with people and teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded. And so the rest of the week, we're going to focus on how we do this. How do we fulfill the heart of the mission? And I hope the groundwork has been laid. And if there's something that's going on in your life, I want you to know that the idea, you know, the Bible talks about the church 
he uses terms like building because it's a, a place of support and we all have our different pieces, right? And we have, uh, he explains it as a body because we all have different parts of our body that makes up the one body and each part is important and vital. The third one that he uses to illustrate the church is family. And that's what I want to focus on this evening. We want to be a family to you this evening. That means that if there's something that's going on in your life, if you are not a member of the family, we would encourage you, certainly, be a part of the family. So that the kingdom of God is you, and it's in you. It's who you are. It's your essence. And we can do that by making you a disciple, a true follower of Jesus, baptize you so that you can be fixed, so that you can be healed, and will help you to develop into being the kind of Christian that God wants you to be, being the kind of disciple that Jesus calls you to be by serving you. And if you are a part of the family and there's something that's going on in your life, we want to serve you this evening. Whatever it might be that's going on in your life, please let us know. We will pray for you. We will work with you. We will do whatever we have to to get you back on the right path. And we will rally around you. It's not a time for embarrassment. It's a time to lift one another up, to encourage one another, to teach, to observe all things that he has commanded. And we'll invest that time in you and serve you. If you'll just let us know by coming forward and sitting on the front while we stand and while we sing.